We continue with week three of the grade 10 English lockdown lessons. Welcome back grade 10s. Today is the second of this week's four lessons. You know that you are most welcome to contact me should you have any concerns or queries. We shall continue our study of the third act of Macbeth, the act where Banquo takes Macbeth up on the invitation to the banquet, just not in the way that Macbeth expects. Please have all of your material readily available on your work surface before you continue with the rest of this video. So what's on the menu for today's lesson? Firstly, we'll consolidate what we did in the previous lesson, and then we'll study the next two scenes of Act 3. I do advise you to continue watching one of the performances on digital theatre. Let's have a look at the questions that you should have answered after yesterday's lesson. Remember that we don't have the benefit of class discussions during these lockdown lessons. So I will be missing your varied and valuable input to the answers of these questions. You could well have written something relevant and correct, which I don't mention. If you're unsure, ask questions on Edmodo. We'll all be able to continue the discussion there. The first question. How does Macbeth behave here? We know that he is planning to murder Banquo, so his warm welcome comes across as false. Macbeth uses regal language when extending an invitation to the banquet. He says, we're holding here a solemn supper and I request your presence. Well, that sounds more like an order than a request, doesn't it? Macbeth also cleverly elicits important information from Banquo by asking him those three strategic questions. Are you riding this afternoon? Are you riding far? And goes flounce with you? Macbeth is definitely being the serpent under the flower, isn't he? Macbeth justifies his actions with two reasons. He is afraid of Banquo's royal character. There is an obvious irony here that a king recognises royalty in a commoner. Secondly, as Macbeth considers the witch's prophecies, he realises that by killing Duncan he might have made it easier for Banquo to become a king. A case of doing the dirty work so that someone else can benefit. He says that he has murdered the gracious Duncan for Banquo and his children. He knows that the price he will pay is eternal damnation. Macbeth's persuasive language is dealt with thoroughly in the video analysis of the scene that you watched in your previous lesson. I hope you use that information in your answer to this question. Among the techniques that Macbeth uses are blaming Banquo for the previous misfortunes of the murderers, encouraging the murderers to take revenge on Banquo for these imagined wrongs, challenging the murderer's masculinity and convincing them that he cannot commit the murder himself for political reasons. Yeah, right. I hope that you notice the dog imagery used by Macbeth. In a sense, he is asking the murderers what kind of dogs they are. Poodles and lap dogs or brave bull mastiffs? Macbeth is appealing to their bravado while he exploits their limited knowledge. The rhyming couplet is, it's been decided, Banquo, your soul's flight, if it is going to heaven, will go tonight. Once again, Macbeth's speech patterns align him with the chanting that we heard from the witches. 
It's time to continue with Act 3. Please turn to page 84 in your textbook for the beginning of Scene 2. While you have been focusing on themes in the play, I would like you to make notes on some of the key imagery. In this scene, or in fact throughout the play, there are numerous references to animals and wildlife. Identify them. At the same time, pay close attention to the shifting dynamics in the Macbeth's relationship. The pictures on the slides that follow are obviously linked to key quotes that make use of animal imagery. We can only imagine how threatened Macbeth feels when he desperately cries out to his wife, Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. Is this evidence of a descent into madness? You will remember that Hecate is the fourth witch or goddess of witchcraft. It was believed that bats were creatures used by witches and beetles make loud noises. This imagery contributes to an atmosphere of moral darkness and evil. Crows and rooks are carrion birds associated with death and decay. Consider these two quotes. What do they reveal about the thoughts of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth? Do you notice that one quote reveals a troubled mind while the other shows someone who can make decisions and take command? In scene two, the Macbeths have a conversation about their immediate future. Both of them seem concerned about Banquo, but there is a change in Lady Macbeth. She seems uncertain, possibly regretful. In contrast, Macbeth is now making firm plans to secure his position. Listen to Mark Birch's analysis of the scene in the next slide. Again, if there are any terms which you don't recognise or remember, write them down in your notebook and look them up. And don't be frightened by terms such as zoomorphic metaphors. You will be able to work it out. Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of Macbeth Act 3, Scene 2. The scene begins with Lady Macbeth also reflecting on the significance of Banquo given the words of the witches. This echoes the situation with Macbeth in the previous scene. However, while Macbeth was certain, Lady Macbeth now seems to have undergone a change and seems absolutely uncertain. Um, she begins with an interrogative, is Banquo gone from court? And she also then asks a servant to arrange to speak to Macbeth. All of the power seems to have dissipated from her character. Shakespeare gives Lady Macbeth a very short soliloquy, which might be structurally significant in itself. Um, the shortness of the soliloquy perhaps mirroring how her power has now diminished. The antithetical parallelism of the opening line of the soliloquy is one that's based on hyperbole. We have the extreme contrast between the lack of true achievement and the enormous efforts made to secure the throne through the act of regicide. So you have this powerful contrast between naught and all. The dissatisfaction of Lady Macbeth parallels that of her husband following the murder of Duncan in Act 2, Scene 2. Um, there's a sense of insecurity that dominates this. Lady Macbeth reflects that it would be better to be dead than to be unsettled by the murder that's been committed. And it's worth noting the really heavy alliteration of the ponderous duh sound, which could be argued to complement Lady Macbeth's sombre reflections. You can hear it really clearly in We destroy them by destruction, dwell in doubtful. It's also worth recognising that the use of rhyming couplets could remind the audience of the stimulus of the witches in the fulfilment of this desire, or convey a sense of finality, uh, linking the words to the death that Lady Macbeth sees as preferable, or the end of the efforts required to attain the crown. When engaging with her husband, Lady Macbeth talks as if she believes that Macbeth has been worrying about the murder of Duncan. He's been on his own with his thoughts and stressing about it. 
And this is really evidence of the decline in her power once again. And it's conveyed through the dramatic irony of the audience appreciating that Macbeth has been far from that. In fact, rather than reflecting on his own, he's actually been acting. He's been putting into effect the murder of Banquo. And Lady Macbeth is completely ignorant of this. In fact, it's her that's been moping around and worrying about the murder of Duncan and its effects. It's also worth noting that she states what's done is done, which echoes Macbeth's words from Act 1, Scene 7, when he says, if it were done, when tis done, again representing that parallel that exists between the Macbeths, but the way in which now their roles have been reversed. Macbeth then uses the metaphor of a snake, saying we've scotched the snake, not killed it. Scotched meaning wounded or scorched. But this metaphor of a snake is... Something that's a motif repeated at various points in the play, notably with Fleance. The image is based on the idea that a wounded snake could heal itself, and the ineffective violence or the incomplete murders that have taken place, the poor malice, is endangered by the snake's original venom. Shakespeare makes the change in Macbeth to a kind of malevolent force really apparent at this point in the play when he says, but let the frame of things disjoint both the worlds suffer. In other words, let the universe fall apart. Heaven and earth suffer before he's allowing himself to succumb to the kind of terrible dreams that shake him nightly. Um, this idea of Macbeth shall sleep no more that we heard earlier in the play has now apparently come to pass. Um, he's suffering from terrible dreams. He can't sleep. Sleep being a frequently used motif to link to the idea of guilt. Um, those that are guiltless are able to sleep. Those that are guilty suffer from terrible dreams and are unable to have the peace of sleep. And it's interesting that Shakespeare employs a homographic pun based on the word peace. Uh, the two meanings being the piece of achieving ambition, being at rest in terms of what's required in the future, and then the heavenly piece of death. When Lady Macbeth tells her husband to sleek away your rugged looks, be bright and jovial among your guests tonight, she's once again calling on him to be deceitful. Um, this reminds us again of those faces acting as masks to the heart, uh, the theme of deceit being employed through the idea of false face must hide what the false heart doth know from Act 1, Scene 7. But notice that it's Macbeth that's now saying this as well as Lady Macbeth. Again, that sense of their power shifting. In fact, he talks about deceit more than she does and lies to her during the course of this. He tells her to let your remembrance apply to Banquo, present him eminence both with eye and tongue. In other words, you know, look on him favorably, you know, be kind in the kind of words that you use when you meet Banquo, knowing full well that he's already put a plan into, a, into place for Banquo to be murdered before Lady Macbeth can see him again. The kind of suffering that Macbeth's mind's played with is evident in both the exclamation that follows this and the zoomorphic metaphor that's employed. For his brain to be full of scorpions is to suggest the kind of pain and suffering, uh, the poison that's inflicting his mind. Macbeth then employs lots of gothic imagery. Um, this kind of gothic imagery has been employed before as he was about to murder Duncan. And it's the kind of thing as well that Lady Macbeth employed when she uh, went through her transformation in Act 1, Scene 5. Uh, but what's interesting as well at the end of this is the use of euphemism. Uh, Macbeth says there will be a deed of dreadful note. Perhaps to hide the deed because he finds it distasteful, but I think it's far more likely that he's hiding it from Lady Macbeth. This is perhaps evidenced in Macbeth's seemingly condescending words to his wife, be innocent of the knowledge, dearest Chuck. We have a profound role reversal evident in Lady Macbeth as well, asking Macbeth for direction, what's to be done? She's turning to him, he now has the power. And it's also interesting to compare Macbeth's response when he states, come sealing night, scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day. Uh, very similar to Lady Macbeth's come thick night in act one, scene five. Uh, both of them now seeking the aid of the dark. They are creatures of evil whose acts should be shrouded in darkness. Okay, so. You are now prepared to answer these four questions on Act 3, Scene 2. As always, please do this in your notebook. Write headings so that it will be easy to navigate when you revise for tests and exams. Pause the video until you have completed this task. 
Scene 3 is the murder of Banco and the escape of Fleance. The murder scene is particularly brutal. It's interesting to note that this is the first murder to take place in front of the audience. You'll remember that Duncan was killed off stage. For a change, I've decided to show you a fun video clip of a scene. On the next slide, you will see a group of high school students act out the scene. They are no competition for the likes of Patrick Stewart. Please bear in mind that this scene took place at night. did bid thee join with us? Macbeth. He needs not our mistrust, since he delivers our offices and what we have to do to the direction just. And stand with us. The west yet glimmers with some streaks of day. Now spurs the lated traveler apace to gain the timely inn, and near approaches the subject of our watch. Hark, I hear someone. Give us a light there, ho! Oh. Then tis he, the rest that are in the note of expectation, are already in the court. His horses go about. Almost a mile, but he does usually. So all men do. From the pence of the palace gate do make it their walk. A light, a light! Tis he. Stand to it. It will be rain tonight. Let it come down. Oh! Oh! Fly, Clarence, fly! 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 Oh, 
a slave. Who did strike out the light? Was not the way. There's but one down. The sun has fled. We have lost best half of our affair. Well, let's away and say how much is done. It would have been fun to do that with your classmates. Hmm, who would you cast as Banquo? Flounce? Hmm, and who would be the murderers? Now that you've watched the dispatching of Banquo, you're ready to answer the questions on scene three. Again, please do them in your notebook. Pause the video until you have finished. Significant quotes from this scene are on this slide. Banquo shouts out treachery as he realizes that he has been betrayed. I'm sure that he knew exactly who was behind this attack. He sacrifices himself so that his son can escape. A hero indeed. I don't know about you, but I would hate to be in the murderer's shoes when they return to Macbeth and inform him that they only got half of the job done. And just in case you thought I'd forgotten, here's the theme slide again. I'm expecting you to update your notes on these themes on a daily basis. Goodbye, grade 10s. Until our next lesson.